welcome. I wanted to welcome everyone to today's disease education webinar. I'm very excited to be able to introduce Dr. Anoop Nambiar, who is the Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Texas Health in San Antonio. He's also the founding director of their ILD program and clinic at UT Health and is one of our PFF care center sites. He's also very involved with the San Antonio Pulmonary Fibrosis Support Group, acting as their medical director, and very excited that this year he's actually going to be one of the co-chairs at the 2019 PFF Summit, which is also happening in San Antonio on November 7th through the 9th, and we're hoping that many of you will be able to attend that event. So today's topic is idiopathic interstitial lung disease, when a cause is truly unidentifiable. And I'm thinking this will be a very pertinent topic for many of you who probably have gone through the struggles of trying to get a correct diagnosis. As you know, it's a complicated disease and complicated disease diagnostic process. So I'm really excited to have, have Dr. Nambiar be able to kind of take us through this and we'll have opportunities at the end for questions and um, Again, also, if you have questions that we are not able to answer, you'll be able to reach out to the uh, Patient Communication Center, which will provide that information at the end of, of the call. So thank you very much, Dr. Nambiar. Thank you so much, Pauline. Uh, thank you to the PFF uh, for inviting me to talk. It's really an honor and privilege. And as uh, some of you may know, you know, I, ILD and uh, pulmonary fibrosis is really a, uh, a passion of mine. We're, we're all, myself and a lot of us uh, in the field are working hard to um, find a cure, hopefully one day soon. So I chose this, um, I guess that's the title, um, primarily because I saw a number of other PFF disease education webinars addressing trying to identify a cause to uh, interest lung disease. And when I was tasked with this topic, I really wanted to focus on when a cause was truly unidentifiable and therefore uh, in the group of idiopathic interstitial lung diseases. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, this is my title slide, which Pauline very graciously uh, uh, mentioned. And so some of my disclosures uh, are that I do work with a, uh, a number of different uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, in research grants cons as a consultant on speakers bureaus. Also, importantly, as a medical disclaimer, uh, please know that any information contained in this presentation is for informational and or educational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Always consult your personal physician or healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your specific medical condition. So I want to start uh, with kind of a 30,000 foot view, so to speak, uh, and just making sure that uh, everybody's on the same page with what we're talking about. And really, you know, um, uh, we're talking about interstitial lung diseases or ILDs. And this is a slide that I use um, in many of my talks to get everybody uh, together on the same uh, on the same page. And here we start with the um, in a, a look at the lungs from a uh, low power view. And as you go further in, uh, into the lung structure, uh, you can see the lung sacs or alveoli, and they're kind of wrapped around a um, uh, blood vessels called capillaries. And when you go into even further higher power view, going into the more microscopic uh, area to that, the next uh, part of that uh, on that slide to the right, you can see that the interstitial space is really that interface where the oxygen in the lung sacs is trying to make its way across uh, the alveoli into the bloodstream. And that's kind of that area where we're really focused on. And, and that's where um, interstitial inflammation can occur and or fibrosis, which then subsequently leads to the lungs shrinking in size. So you get a reduced lung capacity. And we usually would measure that uh, with uh, breathing tests and a forced vital capacity. Or you can even and also get reduced gas exchange, so a reduced DLCO or diffusion capacity can then occur. And typically, patients then will develop uh, symptoms of cough and shortness of breath. And then over time, if this were to progress, then it leads to respiratory failure and, and, and death. So in 2013, uh, the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society uh, put together a task force and a committee. Uh, basically charged with updating the 2002 classification 
of these idiopathic ILDs, or interstitial pneumonias is another term that we sometimes use. And the 2013 guidelines that we uh, that are currently uh, in use and uh, and that we use on a regular basis essentially divides uh, the different IIPs or idiopathic ILDs into major, rare, and unclassifiable groups. And we are I'm planning on really um, diving deep into this. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide other than just making sure everyone is aware that this, these guidelines are active and in, in use and regular practice. So I like to kind of make it more schematic and make it easier to, to look at. And so we start with that ILD umbrella term, which we've already talked about. And of the ILDs, there really are, are two big groups that you can break it up to. And here are there's four, but essentially there's ILDs of unknown cause or idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or IIPs. That's the one that we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, on today's webinar. Or the ILDs of known cause, and some of those are mentioned there, which are really topics, uh, and, and you can spend an hour each on uh, those diseases. Of the IIPs, we break it into major category, a rare category, and unclassifiable categories. And these are the, the uh, basically um, nine different uh, areas that we're going to try to address um, in this uh, webinar. So also want to just make sure that we stay on the same page as far as what is idiopathic means, in case there's folks who I'm sure have not maybe even heard about that term. So this I pulled from uh, the Merriam-Webster online dictionary. Of course, everything's on Google these days, so uh, this was pretty easy to pull. And the definition of idiopathic is arising spontaneously or from an obscure or unknown cause or and also peculiar to the individual. And kind of going in a little bit deeper, idiopathic really joins the combining form of idio, which is the Greek uh, for meaning uh, one's own or private, and pathic, which is a, um, uh, associated with the effects of a disease. And that's how we get idiopathic. basically a disease of which we cannot otherwise identify a reason for, an unknown cause uh, to it. And this is kind of what I mentioned of a ILDs bring it down unknown cause versus a known cause. And I wanted to mention that uh, in this disease uh, education series available online are a number of fantastic talks that I would encourage everybody to take a look at on autoimmune disease associated ILDs. These are some of them. I also uh, looked and saw that we have some uh, uh, really great webinars on exposure-related ILDs, things at work, workplace like asbestos, home, especially moles and uh, bird uh, and down feathers, hobbies also can be associated with uh, cause of ILD. If we can otherwise identify a cause or an association, we now are in that idiopathic uh, ILD world, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today, where there's no identifiable cause or association. And the most common and the most deadly, as a lot of us know, and, and uh, what we focused our, uh, our thoughts and research is on IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is another schematic, kind of just looking at the world of ILDs. And I, I really like the way that this um, uh, breaks things down because I think it highlights a few things. One is that, of course, IPF being in the center uh, gets and has gotten the most attention, and rightfully so, because of the poor prognosis associated with it. But we're also finding that uh, there's a lot of overlap in a number of this, these different ILDs. And I think Pauline mentioned this is such a complex world, and it's very difficult to navigate, not only if you're a patient, family member, uh, but also if you're a physician. Uh, pulmonologist or even an expert ILD specialist. And I wanted to look at the idiopathic ILDs, which is a little bit to the left on this oval. And you can see the list of different idiopathic ILDs we mentioned, and IPF is one of those. And that's why there is a shared, uh, that, that oval is shared with that IPF circle. So going into more about the idiopathic ILDs. 
So this is just a ballpark estimate a, um, uh, that I came up with. And just think about my own clinical experience in our over here at UT Health San Antonio. Of the IIPs or idiopathic ILDs, I would say that IPF still is the majority, but we do see some of the other uh, idiopathic uh, intrafural pneumonias, uh, idiopathic NSIP, uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, unclassifiable IIP, the U-IIP, and other ones, but it's smaller um, percentages than we do see IPF, but those are still important to recognize and differentiate from IPF, I think most importantly, from a prognostic standpoint, but also from a treatment standpoint. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second here. So what I did in the next few slides is really break down further uh, the different idiopathic ILDs that uh, have been, uh, that we have classifications for. And I kinda of wanted to create a, basically a one slide for each just to make it simple, easy to look at, um, and, and in at least a consistent way of uh, approaching it. So starting with IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which as we've talked about, is probably the one that uh, many of us have heard about and a lot of us um, are researching and, and developing better, safer treatments. What is it? Um, it's a chronic, so chronic meaning of a, a more prolonged duration, typically, uh, over uh, in the neighborhood of six months or longer, scarring or fibrosis, lung disease of unknown cause. Therefore, it's an idiopathic type of pulmonary fibrosis. But it's important that it's a specific type because of some of the features of it. And when we diagnose it, we're not only going through a history and physical, primarily to exclude other explanations for why somebody has scarring in their lungs, blood work, especially ruling out autoimmune diseases, breathing tests or PFTs, pulmonary function tests, to get a sense of someone's uh, lung function. The high-resolution CT, I, I started because that is probably one of the most important tests. Number one, confirm that somebody has pulmonary fibrosis. Number two, with a good high-quality scan, we can get more information about the type of pulmonary fibrosis it is and whether it could meet criteria for being IPF. And ultimately, I have MDD listed here, which is multidisciplinary discussion. That is going to be for bringing everyone together at a, uh, at a uh, conference, pulmonologists, uh, radiologists, pathologists, to talk about someone's case, and then decide if, we, if the CT scan is not sufficient to confidently diagnose someone with IPF, then we might sometimes do a bronchoscopy, go into someone's lung, take samples, or a surgical lung biopsy where we um, obtain lung tissue through small incisions um, uh, on the chest. But the goal of, uh, of these tests is really identify if somebody has UIP pattern, usual interstitial pneumonia pattern, and we can sometimes figure that out based on a CT scan alone. And so here's a, uh, an image of a classic uh, high resolution CT showing uh, pretty extensive uh, reticulation or white lines, linear uh, opacity, um, traction bronchiectasis, which basically is airways opened up, splayed open due to adjacent fibrosis. But most importantly, this scan, I think, really shows honeycombing change. So just like a bee's honeycomb, you have these small holes in the lung that are typically starting subplural at the edge of the lung, but then over time, as the disease progresses, then that honeycombing change starts going, advancing more centrally, and also uh, from the bottom of the lung toward the top of the lung. This is a pathology slide. Just wanted to show that um, uh, the kind of the more of the pink area in this slide, more pink is actually looking at uh, mostly fibrosis, and that it has a patchwork, so it means it's heterogeneous, there's some areas of uh, abnormality when we do a biopsy that have classic features, and it might be sitting right next to normal-looking preserved lung. And that's actually a very classic feature for um, UIP pattern, is that it, there's heterogeneity uh, geographically and also temporally, meaning that there's some areas that are much worse fibrosis and some areas with more early fibrosis. Then we go to the treatment plan. And again, I want to make this really brief in terms of this slide, just highlighting the key aspects. 
But the most important things to recognize for treatment of IPF, as many of you are aware, because it's a chronic, irreversible, and high risk of progressive progression of the disease, we always want to think about lung transplant, or LTX here in the abbreviation. Um, antifibrotics are available, as we know, to help slow down the disease progression and perhaps even and, uh, prolong uh, progression-free survival uh, and maybe improve other outcomes, too. Uh, clinical trials are also another uh, very important aspect of management to help develop better, safer treatment, home oxygen, pulmonary rehab, et cetera. So going to the next type of idiopathic ILD or IIP would be idiopathic fibrotic NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. And I use this kind of abbreviation here, INSIP. What is it? Basically, it's chronic, similar to IPF being chronic, fibrosing, they're scarring in the lung, but there also may be inflammation that may be present. And to be idiopathic, as we've said already, we can't identify a reason for it. There's an unknown cause or association um, uh, for it. We do similar diagnostic workup, uh, history of physical, laboratory tests, breathing tests, the CT scan, probably again, start because it's one of the most important, if not the most important, tests that needs to be done. And this is an example of a CT scan showing NSIP pattern which basically the way you know uh, we would describe it is there's area of white on the uh, on the CT you can see here we call it opacity and it's bilateral so both lungs involved and there's what we call ground glass opacity so we can kind of see it's an area of hazy whiteness and you can kind of make your you can see through it and that's what we call ground glass because it's similar to as if you had ground glass and you 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 were to crush it um, you have a distorted look through that, but you can still see through it. So this is the bilateral ground glass opacity. And I think one of the important features sometimes that we see is even different and diff very importantly different than IPF and UIP is subpleural sparing that sometimes can be noted. And that subpleural sparing, it, it, it spares the edge of the lung, which is the subpleural region. Those features would make you think other than something other than UIP and IPF, and an SIP would be one of those that um, uh, would definitely uh, be concerned for. Treatment for an SIP, especially when it's fibrotic, more fibrotic than inflammatory, is going to be lung transplant. It's going to be the number one thing we want to think about because of the fact that this has not only it's chronic, irreversible, but also high risk for progression. And so we want to also always consider patients uh, who have it, such a type of disease, especially in the lung, um, who could be candidates. We want to make sure uh, that uh, all options are on the table and lung transplant needs to be considered. We now have clinical trials that are enrolling patients uh, with uh, non-IPF types of ILDs, including an SIP. Sometimes when we uh, feel that there may be a fair amount of inflammation present, that's when a trial of steroids and, and immunosuppression in a judici judicious manner, meaning that uh, we want to do it carefully, carefully weighing the pros and cons, um, but sometimes that we can have some, they can have some uh, effect and uh, maybe improve some symptoms. Unfortunately, they have not yet been shown in major, big trials to kind of really see a major improvement or an improvement outcome. Oxygen for these patients are very important to consider and look for and treat, and pulmonary rehab, of course, to maintain that exercise capacity in any type of chronic lung disease, especially in ILDs. This is a uh, look at the lung tissue, uh, basically just showing kind of more of the homogenous, uh, meaning more um, uh, inflammation that's kind of diffusely spread evenly compared to different than IPF and UIP which is kind of more heterogeneous. And you can see a lot of the pink, but also some other areas that are a little bit darker, so a combination of inflammation and fibrosis in the lung tissue in the interstitial space. Then we look at uh, the next one, uh, which is RBILD, or respiratory bronchiolitis-associated ILD. And this really is a smoking-related 
uh, distal airways inflammation, but along with intralung disease. And so you have that combination of features uh, to make this, uh, uh, you know, that uh, would be consistent with this diagnosis. Again, very similar diagnostic evaluation, a lot of the similar tests and things that we do, but most importantly is that high resolution CT, a very high quality, well done HRCT can give you this diagnosis. And you can see here as an image, and basically what we're seeing is that you have um, uh, the lungs with areas of white. You can appreciate that uh, there is some white there, but they're kind of more nodular or more round white and compared to more linear or, or reticulation in some of the other ones. There is some reticulation, you could say, in the periphery, but I would say the ground glass opacities really are the one that, uh, especially nodular, central lobular nodule opacities is what we're, uh, as a key feature here. And when we, if we do a bronchoscopy or a biopsy, sometimes we see specific types of cells, white blood cells called macrophages that have pigmentation in it. And that would be something we'd sometimes refer to as smokers macrophages. In that right context of the scan, and, the, and, the, and if you need a bronchoscopy and, and those findings, uh, which sometimes you don't because sometimes the scan is enough, you can make a conflict diagnosis of RBILD. And the number one treatment, the cornerstone of treatment, because it's so, uh, so well associated with smoking, is smoking cessation, quit smoking. And that sometimes is all that's needed uh, to help these patients. If there is evidence of disease progression, then we may consider a trial of steroids and or immunosuppression. Here's a, a pathology uh, slide just showing some of that inflammation around the airways. And again, it's a distal airway inflammation, but they're also in the setting of ILD present uh, would be the RB ILD diagnosis. The next one is desquamative intracellular pneumonia uh, and abbreviated DIP. And uh, what is it? Smoking related distal airways and alveolar inflammation. And we do a similar workup diagnostically. And most importantly, the CT scan again comes up. We're getting a good high quality scan. Um, really, the key feature is going to be crown glass opacity. So that's that white areas of white on both sides of the lung that you can kind of see through it, but it's not just a regular uh, looking lung tissue, it's not just air filled. There looks to be something else going on, and typically that's inflammation in the lung uh, uh, in this case. Also, sometimes spots in the lung, and if we need to do a um, uh, further sampling, sometimes we'll see those smokers, smokers macrophages um, and, and to help us get this uh, more confident diagnosis. And you can see here in this pathology slide, the key thing is really just a, ver a lot of cells. There's a lot of... Um, uh, purple looking cells that are stained that typically represents a lot of inflammation uh, in the lung that we're seeing and the right um, the right characteristic features then we basically can make that diagnosis of DIP again this is one of those smoking related types of ILDs and similar to RBILD most important thing is quit smoking and um, if we need to because of progression steroids and immune suppression can be uh, Cryptogenic or organizing pneumonia is another type of idiopathic ILD, and we abbreviate it with COP. This can be acute or subacute small airways and alveolar inflammation. So again, remembering that um, uh, this is really going after those lung sacs, the air, the air sacs, and the air, small airways getting to those air sacs. And we do the similar diagnostic workup. But the CT scan again can be very show us very characteristic features, and in this case, you can make out there are these opacities, areas of white on both lungs. Um, the the way those opacities are is that there may be some ground glass, but also we have some difficulty looking through it completely, and sometimes we use the term consolidative opacity, and they also are following the airways, and sometimes we refer that to that as bronchovascular distribution, and that is one of the um, uh, one of the potential ways that cryptogenic organic pneumonia can look on the CT scan. 
sometimes we would, um, in order to get a diagnosis, because other things can look like this, like infection, and, some, and uh, especially infection, then a bronchoscopy and sometimes a surgical biopsy might be needed to uh, find that or at least confirm the diagnosis. And if we get tissue, a lung tissue, this is what it might look like, where basically um, you have a lot of inflammation, which also have these kind of plugs of cells inside the alveolar sacs and the airways. That Those plugs are what, what creates that consolidation look, that area of really white that you can't see through because it's basically blocking uh, really any air getting through that. And uh, that is what we would call an organizing pneumonia pattern. And typically we treat patients, especially when they're more moderate to severe, steroids would be a way to um, really try to help treat that inflammatory uh, process. Even some evidence that even a macrolide antibiotic, uh, something like azithromycin, I think everybody's probably heard of z which is a five-day course of azithromycin, has been shown to actually have some anti-inflammatory effect, and even for some mild cases could be used to treat uh, cryptogenic organism pneumonia. Most importantly, though, is that it's cryptogenic. There's no identifiable cause or association for having that uh, process in the lung. We also have something called AIP, acute interstitial pneumonia. And this is a very severe acute lung inflammatory process that also over time can lead to fibrosis. Some of you may have heard of ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And sometimes uh, AIP, uh, AIP and ARDS share a lot of similarities, especially when it's idiopathic, when there's no identifiable cause for someone's severe lung injury. And this CT scan would show that bilateral changes, ground glass uh, in, in both lungs. And this, a, a patient with this um, would usually be very sick and typically not only in the hospital, but also in the intensive care unit and may require um, being on a ventilator, mechanical ventilation, because of how low their oxygen levels may be. How we diagnose this, similar, but perhaps because this is usually patients are coming to the hospital, we may not get breathing tests because there really wouldn't be a lot of value when somebody is too sick to do breathing tests. We know that they're going to be, it's going to look bad. And so typically we can't or won't do that. We would get imaging. We'd try to get additional data like with a bronchoscopy. We would really be doing, if we needed a lung biopsy, be risky in patients who are too sick. Um, in fact, we could cause more harm than good to them. And we have evidence that doing a surgical biopsy, especially in patients uh, who are sicker, would have um, increased risk for complications. The lung, uh, the CT scan and the uh, lung tissue, if we get biopsy, would show a diffuse alveolar damage pattern. So this is a pretty severe uh, injury to the lungs, not only because of inflammation, but also can be there can be evidence of uh, further progression to fibrosis. And it's a, it fills up the sacs, the air sacs are filled up with uh, we call exudative proteins because of inflammation and really just really destroying the lung. And like I said, for that reason, patients are usually very sick with high amounts of oxygen that are needed to keep enough oxygen in their blood. Treatment is really primarily supportive care because unfortunately we don't have proven treatments for this uh, disease. Uh, but because people are usually very sick, as I mentioned, we would try high dose steroids and sometimes immunosuppressives, but again, without really a lot of good evidence to show that that would help people uh, short term and long term. Another uh, type of uh, idiopathic ILD is idiopathic lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, or ILIP for short. And this is really lung inflammation, but being from it primarily with uh, evidence of one type of white blood cell called lymphocyte that is really driving things. And the CT scan, as you can see here, might show not only some uh, areas of inflammation, but also cysts, the so holes in the lung uh, that can be caused from this disease. Uh, in the, we don't have an image with lower zone ground glass, but similar to those opacities that uh, you can see through it being more in the lower lung and some spots in the lung or nodules, sometimes even thickening 
for reticulation of the lung uh, as well. And typical treatment for this would be, especially for somebody who's symptomatic and having uh, worsening disease, would be a trial of steroids and immunosuppression which um, again, because these number of cases are on the lower side, we don't have a lot of great evidence with a lot of patients that have been studied to really say with certainty that that's the best way to do that, but that is what um, uh, typically we would, we would use. And on this pathology slide, you can see a lot of that inflammatory cells, a lot of those dark staining purple uh, uh, cells in this, in this slide really representing those lymphocytes, a particular type of white blood cell that is very um, uh, profuse uh, in this. And then we get to idiopathic pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis. And this is a one of the, again, a rare type of idiopathic ILD of which I think a lot of the experts might have seen a handful of cases, I think maybe at most. Um, and it's really characterized by dense lung inflammation and or scarring but especially in the upper part of the lungs and the lining of the lungs or pleura. And this is a CT scan image of uh, uh, the lungs in this disease. This is the upper part of the lungs, uh, the main trachea here. And you can see the upper part of the lungs have these white lines, linear opacities, reticulation. So that would be concerning for fibrosis, but there's also a lot of pleural involvement. So you can see here, some of these consolidative, consolidative opacities right on the edge of the lung or in the lining of the lung, which is the pleura, this would be consistent with the uh, disease process such as PPFE. And if it's unknown cause or association, then we call that idiopathic PPFE. So again, the CT showing upper lung inflammation and fibrosis. And very interesting, when you, if you do lung biopsy, not only do you get that dense subpleural and pleural fibrosis, you can see here, this is the edge of the lung and low power view, the lung tissue over here. And you can see that pink, very uh, uh, impressive pink staining. Um, and then here, if you stain for elastin, there is a lot of this, that's what the black stain here is showing, a lot of elastic fibers right beneath that fibrosis. And that's how we get that term. Pleuro, involved in the lining, parenchymal, the lung tissue, fibro, scarring, elastosis, the elastic fibers. So having all these features would give you that diagnosis. Unfortunately, because there's, um, these, this is on the rare side to happen, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence and data to show what is the best way to treat this. But typically, we would use steroids, sometimes immunosuppressives, and it's really uncertain whether antifibrotics uh, have a role here as of yet, but I think more research is needed uh, to find that out. And then ultimately, if we otherwise cannot, we know that somebody has an idiopathic ILD, but we cannot figure out what type of pattern it is, that's what we call the unclassifiable inter idiopathic intracranial pneumonias. And again, I have to say, what is it? We can't really say what it is because there's varying amounts of inflammation and scarring that just don't meet criteria, or at least that we can say confidently is of the other types of idiopathic ILDs. And that's where we have this group. The CT pattern and the pathology would be variable. And therefore, it's really unknown. And, and the number of cases here are on the lower side. It's unknown about how best to treat these patients with unclassifiable ILDs. But sometimes we would give a trial of steroids and immunosuppression. And perhaps, depending on that response, if somebody doesn't respond well, maybe even consider antifibrosis treatments. Why would we get into this situation? Maybe because we don't have enough data, enough uh, uh, clinical or radiologic or pathologic data. And a lot of times it's because maybe somebody's on the older side, they're too ill, where we don't want to subject them to a surgical biopsy because that's what would be needed, but it might be too risky to do that. So we would then, uh, could fall into this unclassifiable category. There also may be cases where a lot of the data that we have just doesn't, it's not consistent. There's discordance. Uh, that some data is pointing in one direction, some data is pointing in the other direction, and therefore we might um, group somebody in the unclassifiable IIP category. Sometimes patients who've been treated in the past might have substantial alteration in their findings on the CT or biopsy, 
And therefore, we might not be able to say confidently or with certainty what exactly what type of ILD or IIP they have. And then it might be in the unclassifiable group. Uh, new entities, unusual variants of a recognized entity may be the case of why we have to call it uh, unclassifiable because it hasn't been really uh, classified yet uh, in its own group, and or multiple radiologic or pathologic patterns. So it's not uncommon to see some patterns overlapping uh, in, actually, you know, in um, these different types of processes. So NSIP overlapping with organized pneumonia or OP. Um, and, and if we can't otherwise put that whole picture together, we can't cleanly put them in a specific category, unclassifiable would be the category that they would be, uh, they would be put in. So, Dr. Oh. Dr. Nambiar, I'm yeah. sorry, a, mm -hmm. a question came in actually talking about that overlap where okay. you, I even had a diagram earlier where you showed the overlap of chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis with IPFs. And, and so when you see sort of these mixed patterns like that, are, are these patients... Uh, uh, something that you would consider using an antifibrotic on? So I think that's a great question. And I think actually uh, probably later on this year, uh, we'll have a little bit, we'll have more high quality evidence from a large prospective trial looking at antifibrotic treatments for ILDs that are not IPF, especially when they're progressive ILDs. And chronic HP would be one of those where, uh, you know, it might be a, so the, the usual approach would be steroids and immunosuppression, but that approach usually at best might help to keep somebody, you know, stable, but really not, usually doesn't significantly improve somebody. And antifibrotics may definitely have a role in those other non-IPF ILDs. We just don't have enough evidence right now to support that, but I would probably say within the next six months, that definitely could change. So um, another way, um, when we have an unclassifiable type of ILD, we can't put it in a good category. Another way of thinking about it may be actually, what is the disease behavior? What is somebody's ILD doing? Is it um, something that seems to be reversible and self-limited? And that's that first uh, uh, row. If so, that would be favoring something more like RBILD, where uh, um, those can, they can be reversible and, with, and even with or without treatment, even just even smoking cessation. And that's where the treatment goal would be removing possible causes um, and, and possibly even using steroids and, and immunosuppressives for more symptomatic progressive disease. But we can usually reverse that uh, because of inflammation primarily as being the problem. If, it's, if it, the disease behavior seems to be reversible but risk for progression, these are some examples, cellular NSIP, uh, DIP, COP. And the goal here, treatment goal, would be try to get that response with aggressive treatment, with st typically steroids and immunosuppression. And then over time, if somebody's doing pretty well, if they re reverse that, then maybe even weaning them off or taking them off that and just monitoring and being prepared to maybe treat again if there's a relapse um, or have um, further symptoms. If there's ILDs that are stable, but there's residual evidence. Sometimes fibrotic NSIPs would fall in that category. The goal would there would be to maintain that, uh, their status. If there's evidence of progression and irreversibility, but maybe we can stabilize, fibrotic NSIPs could fall in that category. And again, the goal there would be to keep somebody stable without further worsening. But if the disease is progressive, irreversible despite treatment, IPF would be in that definitely in that category, because we know that even with the antifibrosis treatments we have available, the best that we can do would be to slow down someone's progression. Unfortunately, the disease still progresses. And so the goal, again, would be slow down the progression and not let things get worse um, too quickly. In follow-up, uh, now that we've, we've passed that diagnostic phase, we've talked about the options for um, treatment for different types of idiopathic ILDs. I think one of the most important things is really monitoring somebody, how they're doing. And we do that in clinic visits, and I typically would do it every three to six months, or in collaboration with a community pulmonologist um, if the patient lives too far away from me. Breathing tests, we always like to get some objective evidence how someone's lung function is doing based on their force vital capacity and diffusion capacity. Do that every three to six months. Six-minute walk test, again, another 
physiologic measurement about how someone's doing with their ILD, and usually every six to 12 months. CT scans, I would usually say every 12 to 18 months. Um, we don't have any really great evidence or recommendations to say that's what has to be done routinely, but I think most of us do it on average about every 12 to 18 months um, to monitor, help monitor someone's ILD, but also make sure that something else has not come up. And something else, meaning something like lung cancer, which is a uh, which is associated in an in increased risk in patients with ILD and IPF. Echocardiogram uh, screening for pulmonary hypertension or high blood pressure in the heart going to the lungs is something I typically would do every twelve every twelve months uh, because that the presence of pulmonary hypertension in ILD would have a um, adverse effect on outcomes. So. This is, again, a very complex, challenging group of diseases, a lot of terminology, uh, the alphabet soup is like, I think a lot of people have referred to it too, uh, as. And for that reason, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation has set up a care center network, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. And these are ILD centers of excellence, started at nine centers in 2013. And currently we have 60 centers all throughout the entire country. And these centers have strengths in patient care, community outreach, education, and research. And this is a schematic with the entire the, the map with the different sites. And it's available online. And here's the, a web link to that. And I also want to you know, give a shout out about the PFF Summit in 2019 in November this year in San Antonio, which is a fantastic venue for not only physicians and scientists, involved in this area like myself, but really bring together with the patients, caregivers, loved ones. And also we have now a, a, a track for transplanted patients with this disease, all bringing everyone together. Um, so I really am, uh, I want to encourage everybody to think about attending and uh, hopefully uh, we can meet and, and chat there uh, as well. So I want to finish with the key points being that the idiopathic ILDs, also known as idiopathic interstitial pneumonias or IITs, are interstitial lung diseases of unknown cause. That's how they get the idiopathic term, but differs in disease duration. Some are acute and subacute versus chronic. IPF, NSIP typically are chronic. Uh, <clears throat> amount of inflammation and scarring present. We looked at the different types of those idiopathic ILDs, and it seemed that some were more fibrotic, like IPF and SIP. <clears throat> some were more inflammation, like RBILD, perhaps, or DIP. <clears throat> Excuse me. Prognosis also can be different because of that. And treatments also can be different. And very important that we try to get as confident a diagnosis so we can implement the right and more, most appropriate treatment plan and avoid harmful treatment. Differentiating these is very important, like I mentioned, but important, and, uh, but challenging to do. <clears throat> and patients with suspected ILD, <clears throat> as I mentioned, should be referred early to the nearest care center for multidisciplinary approach to diagnosis and management. So thank you very much. And I think we'll, we have a Q&A here. Uh, Pauline, I didn't know if you wanted to start with us. Yeah, so that was great. We had it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so a couple questions came in. Um, one, I think you alluded to a little bit about uh, some of the reversibility of some of the diseases. And the question was, when you have a chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis and somebody has birds or mold exposure, would you, um, of course, recommend removing the source of the um, of the fibrosis? But would you expect that to resolve or would it stop? Kind of what, what would you typically expect of the course with something like that? Sure. So I think when it comes to hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, um, the usual way we break that down, and I do, I, I'm pretty sure we have another webinar on that uh, topic itself because that itself could easily be a full hour to talk about. Um, but the most important things to me are trying to figure out whether or not there's some, is it reversible or irreversible? And a lot of that hinges on, is it mostly inflammatory or mostly fibrotic? And then typically we'd say, if it's acute or subacute, if it's still in the early stages, 
especially when there's a lot of ground glass opacities on the CT scan, um, that we, we treat that pretty aggressively. And typically not only with um, environmental uh, assessment, try to remove the, uh, the cause for remediation of the environment, especially things like mold, that itself sometimes can be enough to, to take care of or at least stabilize and reverse some of the inflammation. But oftentimes we do have to treat that with uh, steroids and immunosuppression. If it's more fibrotic or chronic HP, typically then that, that um, would not be fully or not be reversible to any kind of significant extent. The goal there would be to try to stabilize it. And there's some evidence that immunosuppressives and steroids can stabilize that disease. But we also think that even with that, there, if there's progression of the fibrosis, anti-fibrotic fibrotic treatments could play a role. And like, as I mentioned before, I think in the next six months, we probably will hear more about that, where that could be a, 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 a you know, indication uh, is to, uh, to use antifibrotics for more progressive fibrotic uh, ILDs such as HP. Yeah, that, that will be very exciting for patients, definitely. Um, so you also talked about referring patients to the care center network. And I think one of the other questions is referring patients for lung transplant. And when would you typically think about that? And what would you consider a, a good candidate for lung transplant? So I think um, I, I would always, I always start this, uh, the answer to this question with uh, every center is different. Every transplant center we have in the United States is different. And even though a lot of us, they, roughly the similar criteria but a lot of it, I think, is based on their own individual center's experience about how patients did. And I think for that reason, there are some centers, especially higher volume centers, uh, centers that do a lot of lung transplants, and all that information's out there uh, about which ones those are. But I think most people are aware of things like Temple University and Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic. They would oftentimes transplant somebody higher risk. And this is where it gets into what is higher risk. Usually older patients over 75 um, are higher risk. Uh, over 70, some centers, including our center here, would say that the patient's not a candidate at, for a transplant at over 70, but just three hours away over at Methodist Houston in uh, you know maybe 75 could be their criteria. So I think there's a number of different sets of criteria, but I think you know what I always say is that uh, you always look at your own, the center nearest to you, just from an ease and from a support standpoint, uh, there's a much better chance that um, uh, that could happen there. But just getting no from one center, I would definitely not tell a patient or caregiver to give up uh, on that. I think uh, if you try going to uh, seeking an evaluation in another center, and you may find that they would be more willing to uh, uh, transplant uh, you or your loved one uh, compared to another center. That's great, thank you. Uh, so another question was in regard to stem cell treatment, which um, you probably are aware we, uh, the foundation came out with a fairly strong uh, recommendation against stem cell treatment, at least in sort of the, the kind of standalone clinics where people are paying for that, but just kind of what your thoughts are around um, stem cell research and those sorts of things. So I'm, I think I'm going to give you the same answer um, as I give uh, when I get this in clinic. And basically is there's a lot of promise. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's an idea of um, not only, uh, you know, repairing, but also maybe even replacing and forming new tissue like the lung tissue, which in a disease like IPF, when it's so fibrotic and scarred, that, that that's the only way to, uh, to heal it or to get to cure it right now is a lung transplant, basically uh, get new lung tissue in there. So I think there, the idea, the thought of that is a fantastic one. However, a lot of research needs to go into it because of the fact that there is potential harms that we just aren't aware of um, because we don't yet know how best to, uh, to harness that power. And we don't know how to harness the power of something and you try to go too fast and you try to run before you can walk, typically you're going to fall. And, and I, I would be worried that... Um, you know, we just can't advocate, we can't uh, recommend it yet until we get more high quality research. Because right now I would say there's more potential harms than benefits. Um, but I think it's hopeful. It's a very hopeful area that needs more research and more time, but we can't recommend it yet. 
but maybe down the road in the future, uh, we, it may become an option for treatment. Okay, uh, another question really um, around causes of pulmonary fibrosis. Are there, is there evidence to say that fungal or bacterial or viral causes may precipitate pulmonary fibrosis? And then a question similar is, you know, what is the data around uh, those that were either current smokers or former smokers in the development of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? So I'll, have, I'll take the last part of that first, I think, because we know from clinical trials that I would probably say at least 60% or two thirds even are former smokers um, that are in our IPF trials. And so there is an association uh, between smoking and IPF. There's a risk, a risk factor. However, there's no clear cause effect relationship for IPF itself, as opposed to some of these other idiopathic ILDs like RBILD, DIP. Those are very well known uh, uh, associations and, and probable causes from smoking directly. And smoking cessation helps those cases. But for IPF, we know there's an association um, uh, with smokers. It's a risk factor, but um, we haven't, no one's been able to say with certainty or prove it that it, it is a cause of it. But it, I think most people would say um, it probably is a trigger. It could be set, predispose somebody to developing it. Um, as far as uh, micro, microbials, uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, and I would look at this as trigger versus potentiator, something that can make it worse. There's some preliminary evidence that, um, you know, we could find different types of different infections in the lung um, in patients with IPF. Uh, now, is that a cause? So once again, we have that cause versus association, and we haven't yet been able to say with certainty, at least in a lot of patients, that... Um, it's a cause for their ILD, but it seems to be a, uh, it seems to be present in a number of patients. And also it could be a trigger. So we know that infections sometimes can trigger the worsening of someone's ILD and even get to the point of an acute exacerbation, a really severe flare up of someone's ILD. Right now, there's a lot of uh, energy and interest and research going on into looking at the microbiome of the lung. And there's a trial called the Cleanup IPF trial that people can look at on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, and that is investigating that idea about and that concept, but also testing the hypothesis about whether or not anti antibiotics, doxycycline or, or Bactrim, could actually improve outcomes in those patients. And I think if they if it shows that, that also start to lend more evidence that maybe that is a area, uh, the microbiome is something we have to really pay more attention to much more than perhaps we are currently. So I think we're pretty much at the, at the top of the hour. We have a few questions we did not get to, um, but you can obviously uh, reach out to the Patient Communication Center. Uh, the number is listed here on the slide or is what you can either call or email, and hopefully we can address some of those questions. But uh, I want to thank all of you for uh, your participation today and sending in the questions. They were really uh, terrific questions. And also, of course, I want to really thank Dr. Newt Nambiar, who did a wonderful job of taking us through a very, very complicated group of diseases. So I think our next PFF webinar will be on August 28th, another topic that's probably very pertinent to all of you, and that is in supplemental oxygen. And Susan Jacobs from Stanford will be hosting that. So again, thank you, Dr. Nambiar and everyone else for attending. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you, PFF. I really appreciate the invite and a pleasure to talk to everyone today.